All right. I am so excited to be here today. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Association Chat, an online discussion where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with topics of the day, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. I'm the host of Association Chat, Kiki Letalien, and I wanna give a big shout out, big thank you to our visionary Voyager sponsor, Big Red M, the go-to association growth partner, offering consulting, sales, research, and now publishing services too. Their support helps make this podcast and the upcoming Association Chat Road Trip to ASA Annual possible. We also have some exciting news. This week, I'll be speaking at the Council of State Restaurant Associations in Cleveland for their summer conference about AI and marketing. And I'll have the chance to check out Cleveland, which I haven't really spent a lot of time in, before ASA Annual and that road trip that we're taking. So, you know, when we go on August 10th, and we go to Cleveland, I'm gonna have it all scoped out for you and ready to go. Uh, we're taking 35 association professionals and association chat fans on the road uh, with our big sponsors, our Big Red M and Interesting Conversations Company will be there. And so finally with that, uh, I want to branch into what you are all here for today. And that's our big topic. Um, joining us today is Jen Louie, a, a executive coach, career strategist, and she's here to share her insights on transforming your side hustle into your full-time career. Jen's going to reveal the secrets to making the leap to securing your finances and turning your passion project into a professional reality. And this actually, this topic hits very close to home for me. I want to welcome you to Association Chat Podcast, Jen Louie, woo, yay. <laughs> hey Kiki, thanks so much for having me and big thanks to Big Red M for hosting oh, yeah. this. <laughs> um, you know, I, one of the great things about you, I met you uh, at the AWTC, there's an award ceremony, we had a chance to get to talk and um, you shared with me this personal journey, um, talking about transitioning from VP at a nonprofit to being a full-time executive coach and career strategist. And so I thought maybe what we could do is to, to talk a little bit about that, that move, because a couple of things. First, you're not the only person to tell me this story about like moving from doing this one thing, working with associations to going out on your own. But another is, I mean, with things bouncing around and being so unpredictable right now, I, I don't know who isn't wondering, could my path end up going in a different direction? So that's why I'm really, really happy that you could join us today and that we could talk about this particular topic. But yeah, no, tell me the story. Let's talk about that transition. Absolutely. And I think that I know you've had these types of transitions too. So I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I firmly believe that as we evolve, our careers need to evolve with us. Mm -hmm. And the path we thought we were on may no longer serve us. And it's really important to pause every so often to see if we're still going in the right direction. And I think that's to some extent what's happened to me over the years. I've had a lot of career pivots at the senior level. I started out in advertising and I was, you know, in a big agency in New York and in Paris and then went into marketing. So that was my first pivot um, for corporate and then went into the association world and started out as VP of marketing, then pivoted to membership pivoted to professional development, pivoted mm -hmm. to career development and conferences. And so the next sort of path would have been CEO, right? Like just leading an association. And I think in the back of my mind, that was always there. But then when it became a possibility, I suddenly realized that was not the path I wanted. So I did a lot of soul searching around, well, if I don't want to move up, where do I want to go? And um, that was a really good clue. So I think for your listeners, if the path you're on doesn't seem to be the right path anymore, feels uncomfortable, go with that instinct. 
because that's a clue. And then I really fell in love with this concept called Ikigai. It's a Japanese mm. concept of having a reason to live. It's this concept that encourages people to discover what truly matters to them and live a life filled with purpose and joy. So it's not like having a work self and a work identity and then a personal self and a personal identity. It's really having an identity that merges both. And being somebody who's always been pretty passionate about work, that was something important to me. So I thought, okay, I'm going to figure out what my ikigai is. Mm. And, um, realized that the patterns throughout my life were around coaching whether it was working behind the scenes with volunteer leaders and coaching them to be their very best on stage, um, to coaching teams. And then this other area of meaning and finding meaning was always part of my life. My undergrad, I have an MBA, but my undergrad was actually in philosophy, which is gonna... <laughs> meaning in life. So all that together made me realize coaching was probably the area for me. And mm -hmm. then from there, I worked with executive coaches to figure out what the next step could look like, what training I could take, and then how to ultimately build the side hustle. See, I knew I liked you. I love <laughs> the philosophy background. And it's it's just one thing that somebody can say about you is that it, it's you're not afraid to try new things. You're not afraid to go in new directions. And yet I think that, um, you know, for a lot of people, they feel hung up on making some changes. It can feel very, very scary. Um, even if they, how do we say this? I, I key guy, I key guy. How do we say it? I guy, I key guy. Okay. Even, even if they're like, yeah, I want to work in another, another way that I've kind of heard this same sort of concept talked about is working in your zone of genius, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're trying to work in your zone of genius. And then I can't remember his name. I love his book um, where he talks about that. But um, that same sort of concept, it sounds like, I, it feels like even if people can connect with what that is, the jump to get there or the move to get there can seem just... Uh, scary. And like, like there's, um, a lot of uncertainty and fear around it. How do you know when it's time? How do you know when maybe you should make a move? Um, I know in your article that you talked about, and I, I posted a link to it, I'll post a link to it again. Um, that your latest article that was in fast company that had to do how to turn with, uh, how to turn your side hustle into your career, you talk about finances, you talk about like, you know, making sure your finances are where they need to be. How do you, how do you know when your side hustle or your finances, are, you're financially in a spot where you can do this thing? So first off, I have a whole other article coming out in Fast Company around <laughs> finding your side hustle, because I think that's a big question. So it's, what is it that I want to do? So now mm -hmm. we're, we're assuming you've figured out what that is and that you've built something. So you have almost have a minimal viable product of what this thing is that you could do on the side, whether it's, you know, video production and, you know, you want to take your video production side hustle to become your main hustle. Like, how do you know financially that it will work? I think there's a lot of different elements. The first is having a reserve so that if suddenly you don't get any clients when you go for it, like you have something to fall back on and you're not in despair. I think that's a big one. Yeah. The next one is what can you cut back on? Like really preparing your finances to cut back on certain things. I'll give you an example. This one's really funny. During the pandemic, I have two daughters. And obviously we couldn't go anywhere, but where we did go was the car wash and we would put the music on really loud and have a dance in the car wash in the oh car. Oh my gosh. I love this. It was great. However, after the pandemic, we never really used the car wash. Like I, I never washed my car, but I was still paying 25 bucks a month for that. Subscription. For that car wash. That was your, 
It used it was to be really... on the entertainment side of our budget. Now, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that's an example. Like, look at your credit card and see what you're spending on that you might not need anymore. Like, I had all these gym memberships. I didn't need that many gym memberships. Mm -hmm. Really looking at cutting back. And then the other thing is. Um, managing expectations with your family. So I have two teenagers and I said, look, mom's gonna go out on her own. That all that stuff I've been buying you, I'm not gonna be able to buy as much for you. So they got jobs and I actually think that's a good thing. So, yeah. you know, I think it's a combination of managing expectations, also managing what your expectations are for how much you're gonna make. And, um, you know, my goal was to just cover expenses the first year. I was not expecting to make as much as I made at the association. And part of it is what's priceless is the flexibility you get, mm -hmm. right? You're building your own thing. And now you can decide when you're working and when you're not working. And to me, that in some sense is priceless. That's true. I mean, I think you, you do bring that on that financial question. Uh, there's so many association people live in the DC metro area and we all know how, you know, how expensive it can be cost of living there. It's pretty high. And I know that a lot of people and oh, I see LinkedIn user over here says yay for teenagers who work. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Um, I have a teenager needs to get a job. So you know, um, she's getting there, right? Uh, but, <laughs> it's hard. But I have to say that that when I went out on my own um, and started my consultancy for the first time, here's how it started for me. It started with having one person who said, you know, if if I could be your client um, and you just work on my project, I could pay you X amount of dollars. And I saw dollar signs and I knew that I wanted to try to go out on my own at some point. And I thought, oh, well, that will be a nice foundation for all the other business that will come in. It's that all the other business that would come in that I really, looking back on it, I probably should have had a little bit more strategy going into it, a little bit more savings going into it. Because um, what happens if that one client, that one major foundational client that you have goes away or decides to cut back or decides to pause or whatever it is. And sure enough, eventually that was the thing that, that happened with me. And I found myself going, oh, here I did this thing and I made this big leap and I wasn't quite prepared the way that I should have been. So I think your advice is really good based on what I've experienced and, and observed. Um, the people in our industry it, or in the association industry um, who I've witnessed do a, a pretty good job of growing their consultancies or, or taking care of themselves and their families pretty well has been when they start out with a little bit of a plan and they've got some savings built up so that they can weather any financial storms that come their way. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you're talking about having an anchor client, which is absolutely wonderful if you can do that. The other concept that I'm just going to put forward, at least in coaching, is that there are organizations that provide coaching that you can work with. So, for example, mm -hmm. I became a coach for Better Up more as a security piece in case I would have no clients, right? Right. And then the third area is sometimes people be, build a side hustle, but they don't have to go the entrepreneurial way. Like for coaching, mm -hmm. again, you could become a coach for an organization. So basically, you're pivoting your career, but maybe it's pivoting it to do something different for someone else. And that's sort of another backup strategy, right? Like if in the first year it doesn't work out at all, where can I take this new skill set that I've built that I'm passionate about and use it for them? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's another area. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that those are things, the the partnerships, the collaborations, the natural sort of organic connections you can make with others. Um, all things, great ideas, things I ended up doing in my own life, uh, things that I didn't start out doing uh, when I went on my own. Basically, when people come and talk to me about my experience, um, you know, which I had my own business for over 10 years, 
But I've got to tell you, I, I probably made every mistake you could possibly make and then some um, and can tell you all the things not to do. So like listening to your advice is fantastic because I can say for sure uh, it's definitely the right way to, to start, the right way to go um, all the way through um, the savings before making the leap. You know, you I love the idea that you were looking through and saying, what can I cut out? what do I not need to have? I think the conversation that you had with your children about it, like let's talk about expectations and what might be changing around the house too. Um, and by the way, I don't want to, I don't want to emphasize all this stuff that's scary or bad, but I think this is really important to talk about. Like you have other people in your lives, probably friends who might expect you to continue to go out or vacation with them the way that you used to. Um, kids who might expect you to like be able to buy all the things when they exactly when they need it um, or when they want it. And uh, let's not even talk about like partners, right? Who, who are going to be over here saying, wait a second, you don't know exactly when you're going to get that invoice paid by somebody, you know, like, what does that mean for um, how we're operating together with our finances? So I think that like those discussions, that's a really interesting piece you brought up is how you're talking to the people around you. Absolutely. And I think, you know, your partner obviously is number one to talk this over with. Yeah.